All right, good evening, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to Kingdom Dynamics. Um, so let me make sure everything is as I want it to be for this show tonight. Yes, okay. And I want to say real quickly, welcome to uh, welcome uh, uh, to Dr. K. Fairchild, uh, Dr. Faye Hanshu, uh, uh, Linda Rowley, one of our students, and and. Uh, you know, uh, quite honestly, we've got some students that are going to be graduating in just a few days. Um, and those few days are <laughs> just a week away, uh, roughly. So next Saturday, uh, June 18th. And so a lot of work to do in the meantime. Let me get this shared to my second timeline right quick. And, uh, and then we'll get this going tonight. I'm rather excited about tonight's lesson. Uh, because this is something I've been contemplating and talking about and working on for uh, some time now. And uh, it is that we've had a lot of questions, a lot of, of struggles, a lot of difficulties in the minds of many people about just who we are. Um, good to see Rita Alvarado joining us tonight. Um, but <clears throat> I, I don't uh, suppose that I will erase all uh, doubt from people's minds tonight, but at least uh, maybe we can make some progress in this understanding of, of, of oneness or sameness. And then also, um, I'll probably talk about separation to some degree because it's a part of this, even though I don't believe in separation uh, from my Creator. So this week I'm flying solo as we talk about the fine line between oneness and separation, or, or oneness and sameness, rather. Good to see Apostle Daniel uh, Williams joining this evening. And let me just say this, whether you're joining right now or you're watching uh, this video after it's on YouTube, World Bible School Media on YouTube, uh, about an hour after the show tonight uh, or less, um, uh, it, it will be good there for, for you to see whenever you want to. So the fine line between oneness and sameness. Now, uh, the question that I posed in my pre-show announcement and the question that seems to be a constant, uh, and I'm just going to put it in question form, is am I, as, am I God as in the divine creator of all things? Or am I as he is? So really to address this, I think it's very important, very pertinent. I, I think it wouldn't be uh, fair at all to do this show and not go to 1 John 4, 17, first of all, uh, in the New King James Version. And we'll look at it in other, uh, uh, another translation at well, as well, at least that. Uh, and, and so I hope you really are open and listening for those of you that are our friends around the world in, in, in many countries and those of you that may be students in various parts of the world, uh, those of you that may be uh, theologians and those of you who may just be uh, students of the word and you're just looking to understand some things. Uh, let's see if we can understand together. So 1 John 4 verse 17 says, love has been perfected among us in this. I want you to notice this, first of all, because really there's been a lot of things preached about 1 John 4, 17 that really are not a part of the text. But this says love has been perfected among us. And I'm, I'm sure that Paul's talking about that first century, or John's talking about that first century group. Um, as well as we can glean from this and say, hey, love's been perfected in me. And then he goes on to say that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, which that statement also needs to be understood. Uh, he says, because as he is, so are we in this world. So I do understand the concept or the aspect of that uh, being in this world, uh, being in this appearance realm. And I have my own um, you know, ideas about that, and I've taught on that many times in different shows. But I want to say this, that within the discourse of this chapter, the conversation is all about love. Uh, if, you, if you don't think that, what you can do is go to translations of Scripture, and you can find out that the translators and the publishers, and I don't know as much as it's the publishers than the translators or vice versa, but they did this. They label sections of Scripture and they did the same thing here in this chapter. So just speaking about this chapter, it says here, first of all, the first few verses talk about for uh, love is uh, love for God and for one another. And then the next section talks about knowing God through love. 
The next section talks about seeing God through love. And then now this portion, and I didn't go beyond that. I'm just talking about just up to this portion of scripture where he talks about the consummation of love. So let me say this, and then my, this might be a little plain spoken. But I really want to make a point. When a newly married couple consummates their union on their wedding night, that consummation awakens them to the reality of their union or oneness, even though they remain two separate individuals, right? Well, I want to talk to you about the word consummation uh, because it really does relate to this. Now, the word consummation defined by Oxford languages is number one, the action of making a marriage or relationship complete by having sexual intercourse, and number two, the point at which something is complete or finalized. I, I, I think both are um, are important, both, both parts of the definition, number one and number two. Number one, looking at a natural perspective, but I really see a supernatural essence in the second point they're making, the point at which something is complete or finalized. I really like that finalized is, is a part of this equation. So the point is this, that we were created in union with Father God, and we were created as one with Him. <clears throat> Notice those are two separate things. We're, we're created from Him, but we're also created as one with Him. And yet, a consummation moment takes place when we are awakened or enlightened to the reality of our union as one. Now for you, uh, and me, that might have been years ago when we still embraced the idea that a person had to repent of all their sins and had to be saved and a very emotional and sometimes traumatic experience for some. But the fact is, is that salvation, although defined differently as we see in the Strongs and we can look in uh, just how this ties together with other scriptures, really means to rescue, sotaria, uh, rescue. Um, and, and I think that's the number one meaning. But the fact is, that might have been your first awakening. The first time you realized that or were enlightened about anything. But and in time, and I know I'm preaching to the choir tonight, to a, a select audience who really already understand this. But there's others who are watching that you may not exactly get this. And I just want to speak into this tonight. You may not real, real, uh, realize the reality of your union as one with your creator. Now, there was a time when saying I was one with God was uh, considered sacrilegious. Uh, it was really an anti or a negative thing to say and really look down on in Christianism. But notice here that John speaks of how love has been, past tense, has been, has been, is a past tense uh, statement, uh, has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. So to know or realize that word was spoken to first century Jewish believers is a real mind blower. And yet we're able to glean from this very concept. So first of all, when you're awakened to just how much you are loved, I think that's the greatest awakening of all. all right, it really is. I mean, it's great to know that I'm one with God. It's great to know that I am created uh, only in the smallest measurements of distance between me and my creator. Okay, so there's not sameness, but there's oneness. I mean, you can say even close to sameness is still not sameness. But, but I think the greatest awakening of all things is to know I am loved and to move into a place where I absolutely no longer doubt at any moment in time that I am loved, right? And so I think that's the greatest awakening. But, but, but when you know just how much you are loved, you have no fear of any form of judgment. Now, I don't know why we take this as judgment from God. I think it's because it talks about the day of judgment. But, you know, that's judgment by anyone. Well, the word judgment comes from the Greek word krisis. And it's interpreted as decision, believe it or not. Judgment, decision. Well, you could say that the judge made a decision and you were therefore judged. Well, the biblical usage of this word, according to the Strong's Concordance, is uh, a separating, a separating, okay? So really, judgment would be a dissecting of what belongs and what does not belong, okay? I mean, that's really important. Now, allegorically, I interpret this word as a 
type of course correction while on our journey in this human form experience. And, and I teach this a lot in the book of Revelation. But what I mean by that is there's times where we feel judgment, but really it's like we're going one direction. And, and all of a sudden, Holy Spirit brings, it's not conviction. Conviction was a wrong word uh, used in Scripture. It's a convincing and so he brings a convincing that I almost feel like I'm being judged, but I end up in the right direction, and all of a sudden, it just feels so much better. Well, the fine line between oneness and sameness is that you were created by the Creator or from the Creator, yet you are not the Creator, even though you have the power to create and recreate things around you and within you. For example, if you've had wrong thinking in you, you can recreate or restructure your thinking. Why? Because you have the mind of Christ, yet you have a belief system that produces uh, unrenewed thinking. So in that unrenewed thinking, I don't want to get, spend a long time there. I want to kind of stick to my notes because I have a lot to share with you tonight. But in that unrenewed thinking, there needs to be a course correction, right? I call that judgment, judging my own thoughts. All right. Now, let's go to the Passion Translation, John 4, 17. And it says, by living in God, or here's this, realizing our relationship with God, Love has been brought to its full expression in us, or literally, love has reached its goal, so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment. Now, I know there was a lot of focus in the first century on the day of judgment. I know that there's been a lot of focus in my lifetime uh, preaching about the day of judgment, and all of that comes from an uh, and I won't say the first century view because they, in the original language, they had a different idea than what we have. But I would say in my lifetime, I've heard all this preaching, I've heard about judgment and even listening to preachers uh, from before I was born. We've heard a lot about judgment because we look at the English translation of the Bible and oftentimes, and I would say for many years, it was interpreted based on an English dictionary. All right. Well, even the theologians of the past three to five hundred years, uh, I believe, have gotten some things wrong because I study a lot, as I said in my show yesterday, I study a lot of commentaries over the years, online commentaries and books on my shelf. And I've literally had to lay some things down and I have found uh, just very few things that I can glean from. And sometimes I even have to make some, some corrections in that. All right. He says, so, uh, so that I will uh, fearlessly face the day of judgment because all that Jesus is or literally in his supernatural expression, so are we in this world. Now, do I look like Jesus today? Not really. I may have a beard. I'm sure beards were didn't have beard trimmers and, and uh, hair was long. They didn't have a lot of, maybe a lot of barbers readily available. Um, they didn't wear collars and, and, and crosses and <laughs> and dresses, or, I mean, they were a di whole different thing. There was a whole different uh, apparel in that time. So to physically say, I look like Jesus in this world, I, I can't say that. But when it comes to the supernatural realm, my supernaturalness is like that of the supernaturalness of, of Jesus. And the reason is, is because we're one. And so it's really important that we grasp that because uh, I think that right here in this world, as he is now, and at this point in Scripture, he has uh, what we call ascended, the ascension. He's ascended into the heavenlies, or literally he uh, went back, manifested, or uh, returned from visibility to invisibility in the supernatural realm of the cloud of witnesses. So there it is that we are one, uh, one city of God with a many-membered body. Okay, so in his supernatural expression, so am I in this world. Now, the consummation of our union is determined by awakening to the truth of the relationship we have with Father God. And in that awakening, we become aware through the revelation of love, which at the moment, the knowledge of Father's love has reached its goal or its destiny within. How does God's love, who Father is, uh, because he is love. And the proper interpretive lens of all scripture is love. If it doesn't make sense in love, when you're looking through love, you need to reinvent or reinterpret scripture and find out what it really means. All right, so, so when God's love reaches its goal, 
is when we realize we are loved. And he can say, finally, they get it, right? Uh, because oftentimes we live in fear. We live in, in, in loneliness. We live in uh, uh, the dictates of, of the physical realm, what we see, hear, and touch. And I know those are just three. I've said it before. I know there are other physical uh, senses. But it seems like what we see, what we hear, what we touch, oftentimes re uh, determines our reality or, in other words, that which we put faith or credibility in. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, the thing about God uh, is that judging people has really been played up in Christendom to the degree, and that's another thing we do when we don't feel love. We feel like we're being judged. We feel like we're being condemned. We feel like God's about to get us, right? And so definitely there's no sameness in that. And quite honestly, there's no oneness in that because we feel so alienated from God. But but the thing is, is that this thing about judging has been played up so much in Christendom to the degree that people around the world are afraid of God. Now, let me just say this. If you're a believer, you might call that a Christian. If you're a believer or you're a non-believer, can you imagine how ridiculous or how odd it would be for you to say, God loves me, God is love, God so loved the world, but yet you're afraid of him. One way you can be afraid of God is to be afraid that everything you do, you might mess up. And if you do, you've been taught that God's going to get you. Well, the truth is that Father does not want anyone to fear him, but only to allow him to love on his creation. Are you hearing that? You know, husbands and wives. One of the things they, they uh, do as they get older, and I'll, I'll use that expression. I don't, I don't have another expression currently. My wife and I are, are, are um, uh, the, uh, January next year, January, January 6th. Uh, we are, uh, we're about to celebrate uh, 50 years of marriage next January. Now, here's the point. When that was one year, you talk about uh, loving on each other. I mean, if it was just holding, and, and here's, and I don't want you to misunderstand, we still hold hands today. We still hug today. We still like to do things together today. We're very much in love. Well, can you imagine if you can get the physical or the natural realm example of that? That that I don't, I, I hate, I would hate the idea that uh, I was afraid of my wife or my wife was afraid of me to the point we withdrew from each other uh, instead of be close to each other. Well, the fact is, is that Father God literally wants to love on his creation. Now, the first step is not you loving on him as much, although God wants that, but it's that he wants to love on you. He will draw you in by love. Well, it's said that the Aramaic can be translated to read, we will have open faces on the day of judgment. Uh, I think this day of judgment is the moment we judge our own misguided beliefs about who God is and how much he loves us. And I believe that's true because I've watched in my own life. Uh, this this June 28th, my my family's throwing a celebration and inviting people um, uh, uh, that uh, I've, I've started preaching roughly, and it was the midsummer of, of 1972, although I don't remember the exact date, uh, I do know uh, that it's been 50 years. And so uh, I, I can think about this, I can think about that, that in those 50 years, uh, I had moments where I was awakened to God loves me a little more. <laughs> Uh, and and so that is an awakening. And, and and when I do that, I have to judge my own misguided beliefs to allow myself to embrace that Father God loves me a little more. Yes, June 25th. Thank you, darling. Um, and, and so uh, we when we uh, do that, we 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 call those moments of divine awakening, or or I call them downloads. Uh, of information, and you could say uploads of information, but the reality is, is we keep having these moments where we realize how much we are loved. So keep on that track, okay? Now, it seems that judgment is always something that is pointed toward the future. 
uh, such as, will I be judged tomorrow? Will I get in trouble tomorrow? Well, the fact is that love provides us with no reason to fear the future or uh, to fear future punishment from God. Uh, I want to tell you, if you don't fear God in the next 60 seconds, there's no need for you to fear him in the next 60 days or the next 60 years. Right? Okay. Because that's not the kind of relationship Father God wants. Now, in 1 Corinthians five uh, 4, verse 5, uh, the New King James says, Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels. Uh, this word counsels can also be translated motives, the motives of the hearts. Then each one each one's praise will come from God. So Jesus always promised to return like a thief in the night. I think that's what a lot of people are afraid of. Uh, a thief in the night, one of the things about the night is you have to equate that to darkness, right? Well, well, any lack of light in your thinking, any lack of love in your thinking is really uh, a th thoughts of darkness. And he did that in that he rose, arose from the grave as promised. Jesus never promised to come back. Uh, he promised to arise from the grave. If you look at the teachings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will see that the promises Jesus made was to return when he was on his way to the cross, which was to face death, uh, which was to face the grave. He promised to return from that. Uh, it doesn't. It's not real hard if you want to. It's not not real hard to put two and two together. And and then he appeared to, uh, uh, um, let me just say it this way, he arose from the grave as promised and appeared to the darkness of mankind's thinking, convincing many that he was alive in us. Of course, we see that in Acts chapter uh, 1. All right, <clears throat> so what makes all of this true? Well, Scripture says that it is because all that Jesus is now, or literally in his supernatural expression, so are we in this world. Well, a footnote from that passage says this could also be rendered because we are what he is in this world. I, I, I say that again, because we are what he is in this world. Now, I said earlier that it's not that I look like Jesus, it's not that I have a beard like Jesus or hair like Jesus or dress like Jesus, but think about not even when I wear a clergy robe am I dressing like Jesus because clergy robes weren't a part of, of that day per se like we have today. Now, having said that, I just read to you where this says this could be interpreted as we are what he is in this world. So what we need to realize is that even if, if you can look at, so behind me is a, a green screen. So you're not seeing a, a anything Photoshopped. You're seeing a, 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 um, uh, a background and effects filter uh, in my uh, Zoom and my OBS and all that stuff. Uh, you're seeing a background filter. And on that, that uh, background, to make that project the way that it is, uh, to the degree that it is, of course, there are, are lights in front of me. There's lights shining on, on the, behind me, but there's a green screen behind me. And so the green screen, and I'm not going to turn it off, but the green screen uh, behind the green screen is the rest of my desk and books and, and uh, plaques and, and uh, figurines and different things like that. Uh, so uh, behind the veil of the flesh, is the supernaturalness of Jesus as spirit in that what he is in this world. That's exactly who we are. Now, commentary also says, or this footnote says, the verb tense is important. We are not like Jesus was as a physical man. Now, listen to this. We're not like Jesus was, but because of grace, we are like he is now, pure and holy, seated in heavenly places and glorified. All right, now, although this speaks of who we've always been, still, it wasn't the physical flesh man Jesus that we're supposed to identify with in terms of lookalikes, okay? Um, I remember uh, some time, some years ago, we were at this, uh, I think it was a basketball game, um, 
and I don't know if one of our kids was in the basketball game or if it was just we were we were supporting the the local uh, schools. Uh, maybe been somebody from the church, but the point is, was that we went there and there was this guy up in the stands, long hair, beard, these eyes that could just pierce right through you, and I said, Jesus. <laughs> knowing he was not Jesus, but I said, Jesus. And so we actually got a photograph together. I have no idea where that is. But uh, I just, I just, <laughs> I just, I just think that if you're looking that to be like the physical Jesus, you're going to, uh, in terms of looks, appearance, uh, you're going to miss out on the point. You are the carbon copy of the supernaturalness of Jesus. Now, something I want to enlighten you to is after his transfiguration, resurrection, and ascension, all of those things that we've talked about before, mankind who had become overcome by Adam's mistaken identity uh, were invited to function from the origin of their union with their creator and stop living from the Adamic separation mindset. So where did separation come in? Well, it started in Adam. Why? Because Adam developed or was the father of the first system called the Babylonian system, which means is defined as confusion. And uh, what he did was he thought he was separated from God. We know that's true in when God comes on the scene and says, Adam, where are you? Adam says, here I am, Lord. I hid because I was naked. God says, who told you you were naked? Adam says, I hid from you because I was separated from you. Therefore, I feared you. And God says, what's this nonsense? You were never separated from me. Okay, so <coughs> that's where separation comes from. Now, you have to understand that is actually the middle of Genesis chapter 3. But back in Genesis chapter 1, especially from the Hebrew language, and from John chapter 1, who points to eternity passwords as a time before time, you have to understand that we were created out of God. We were not created out of Adam. So I am not of Adam, and I refuse to uh, take on any of Adam's concepts as my own. So the real question is, was the species known as mankind separated from God and found themselves needing a savior? I'm not opposed to the idea of a savior. Jesus did come to save us or to rescue our thinking, okay? Rescue our mindsets. Jesus made a statement in John chapter 14 where he was speaking many things to his disciples. And he says this from the Passion Translation. So when that day comes, you will know that I am living in the Father and that you are one with me, for I will be living in you. Well, in this phrase or this passage, for me, Jesus mentions when that day comes as a point of reference to the day or awakening event in your life where mankind understands eternity past coupled with eternal truth of their creative selves. It's really hard to think of us in any kind of a divine way. Now, are you a divine being? Yes. I didn't say you're the divine creator as God. You can create by the power of your words. You can recreate your situation. That's been so off for years and you want to see it different. So you began to speak into it and you recreated your situation. We used to call those confessions of faith. My wife and I did that for years. And not saying we don't make declarations now because we realize that it's very prophetic to make declarations of truth today. Now, here's the revelation that Jesus was trying to get to them, uh, which was to see see the eternal truth of just as he is living or thriving in the knowledge of his father and that he and his father are one, so are we one in him and with him. And, you know, if I just talk to you about the scientific impossibility, the mind brain, uh, the mind teaser, the thing that really gets people uh, really confused is that I'm in him and he's in me. Now that's an utter impossibility. That's a scientific, but, but see, you have to look past the veil of the flesh. Now, as he is, so are we in our earthly appearance or thoughts and actions as the expression of who he is. 
as the expression of who he is. However, that can only happen on the level of revelation we are currently awakened to. So why is this so hard for the human mind or the carnal soul to figure out that I am not separated from my creator, but at the same time, I am not the creator? Well, let's notice this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, a, a verse you're familiar, very familiar with, uh, it says this in the New King James, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are super, uh, spiritually discerned. Now, one look at these, the same verse from the Passion Translation. It says, someone living on an entirely human level, um, or only by the natural man, uh, rejects, okay, rejects or does not have access to the revelations of the Spirit of God, of, of God's Spirit, for they make no sense to him. He cannot understand the revelations of the Spirit because they are only discovered by the illumination of the Spirit. Now, let me say this. Um, yes, the word day means revealing or revelation. Amen. So, so let me say this, that uh, when, you, and, and I find this true today, there are people out there who are trying to understand the supernatural with a natural realm perspective or from a natural realm perspective. But you see, it won't make sense. Now, when, it's, when something doesn't make sense to you and you're trying to understand supernatural truth, but it doesn't make sense and you're using your natural mind, you say, but Dr. Bill, don't you study? Oh, I study a lot. I study, I dissect scripture, I look at Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic when I can, I try to look at, at, at uh, as much as I can, but you see, I'm using that natural means to break through over into a supernatural uh, revelation or awakening. But when all you have is a natural understanding, uh, what you discover is not a, a, a supernatural truth, but you discover confusion. And now, now, if you enter into confusion, what happens is you then um, feel separated uh, from other people in that you think people are wrong, you're right. Well, I want to tell you something. The only way to take this natural ability that God gave you is to hit the books, so to speak, and to discover the illumination of the Spirit that only comes by the Spirit. You see, when pi people try to understand Father's mind in terms of what we call the Christ mind, it cannot be done through human reasoning. Uh, there was a, 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 a writer, uh, E.W. Kenyon, I think it was, yes, who always talked about mental ascent. You, you can't just give it a mental ascent to it. You've got to go deeper than that. For me, I quit giving mental ascent back in about, I don't know, about 2010, 2011. Now, not all at once, but to the degree that I understood, I just, I just wanted to go further. I wanted to get outside the box, so to speak, uh, get outside the theological book, get outside a uh, box, get outside of the, the, the uh, box of my commentaries. Uh, get out outside the box of, of Bible prophecy teachers, and I wanted to find out, you know what, Father, what's really out there? So I could no longer give mental assent to something. I had to approach things by faith. Well, well, let's hear this. The mind of our Father is a supernatural mind of spirit, right? And therefore must be understand or access through the supernatural mind of spirit within you. Now, a footnote from what we just read, uh, they write the natural man or the one without the spirit. Okay, no one's without the spirit, but, but not realizing it can be just as devastating. Or which I think means uh, without leaning on or looking to the supernatural as opposed to trying, uh, trying to reason everything out by the natural mind. So it's here that the Aramaic can be translated as a man in his natural self cannot receive spiritual concepts. So if all you're going to do is say, okay, uh, by the mind of reason, uh, this doesn't work, 
and, and, and this kind of sounds okay, but this over here doesn't work. And so, and then you put together the pieces and you say, but one, two, and three doesn't equal um, um, uh, the right number. And, and you try to make it fit into something else because you just can't get the concept. So in other words, in our human form of carnal mindedness, we do not have access to supernatural, uh, the supernatural through natural reasoning. Now we can use natural reasoning to get there. And I'm just giving you my best shot at this. Now notice this 1 Corinthians 5 verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 15 in the Passion Translation says, those who live in the spirit are able to carefully evaluate all things and they are subject to the scrutiny of no one but God. You know, I've had some ideas. Um, I, I, my wife can tell you that I've had some ideas that seem so out there uh, that I knew they were not going to be, they were not something that was going to be under the scrutiny of any of, of philosophical thinking, but they were totally under the scrutiny of the supernatural mind of God, even if I didn't understand them yet. So here's the thing. The supernatural realm is a matter of understanding two things. One, the spirit, uh, the realm of spirit. Now, the realm of spirit, and I'll give you the second one in a moment, but the realm of spirit, you, you might say uh, God is as vast as the universe in the sky. Well, let me just say this, that the universe in the sky uh, is when you look up and you see the stars at night, uh, or, or you look up in the sky and you see the blue and you see the clouds and you see a jet sweeping by, or if you can get a telescope and you can look way beyond and see stars and planets and etc., you can call that the realm of spirit, but that is in, the, in all practical intents and purposes, the physical universe. Okay, so, but there is something that's supernatural, that's parallel and intertwines with all that we see, and that is the supernatural realm of God. That's the realm of the spirit. And, and one of the th words that Genesis, uh, uh, the Hebrew uses in the book of Genesis is um, um, the expanse. So the expanse is what I would say is the supernatural realm, and it's far bigger than what mankind has discovered about the physical universe. Uh, the universe in, in Scripture encompasses all things. The universe uh, in, in the natural mind just uh, encompasses a certain amount of space, and then mankind's always searching for more space. Okay, so the realm of spirit, it's the expanse of God. And then number two, the mind of our Father Creator. So to know the, to, to really get in touch with the, the realm of spirit is so awe-taking, so breathtaking. It's so huge and massive in that it's unending and unlimited. But when I think about the mind of my Father, His mind, His thoughts, I feel going through me a lot. And his mind and his thoughts are just equally as vast. Now, the known uh, uh, to to know the mind of the Father is beyond what we know from this natural carnal realm perspective, based on uh, human reasoning or looking beyond the physical realm of appearance, based on what we see, hear, and touch. It's bigger than that. It is a state of willingness to venture beyond the realm of human comprehension and looking at the unlimited possibilities of what Father thinks through prayerful communication, studying of the original scriptures, and considering the audience of the culture, of the times, and so on. Uh, and, and I just, I really, I really just love this. Uh, I, I really love that, that we can know that, you know, what the scripture says in, in, uh, in first John verse, uh, chapter two, uh, that says that, um, that you have an unction from the Holy one and you know, all things we, we have, we have pounded that to death, uh, so to speak. Uh, we have, I have an unction from the Holy one and I know all things well, but yet we feel so limited. Well, the Passion Translation footnotes uh, uh, give the indication that what that's really saying is that you have the capacity to know everything that God knows. Why is that? Why? How is it that you have the capacity? Uh, the capacity is, for example, I have a, a Dell 8900 XPS um, a desktop computer 
um, and it has the capacity at this moment in time to run uh, external drives, five external monitors. It has the capacity to run the mic, the speaker. It, but, but at some point, it has a limit. Okay. Now, here's the thing about this this limit. Uh, that's where the capacity, okay, now, if I have the capacity to know everything that's in, that God knows, then here's the thing about it. That capacity is as vast as the spirit realm or as vast as the mind of God, which was, it, which is limitless. So the fact is that uh, when I talk about this and when I venture into these realms, uh, not many people are willing to take the journey of changing one's focus from the English Bible, listen to me, and attempting to understand the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek language meanings, uh, languages, meanings, and concepts. Now, I've had people tell me, we don't need the Greek and Hebrew. Uh, I, I beg to differ from, with you. I mean, unless you do a lot of studying, you can take the English Bible and you can explain it verbatim, and thank God for those who can. Uh, but but chances are they can't do it without knowing. I can't do it without knowing what the original scriptures say. And so uh, it's beautiful that there are people who are willing to go beyond what they can see. Remember interlinear. Uh, yes, Greek and Hebrew interlinear, but just take the word interlinear. Uh, I use it in, in systematic theology in my studies of and teachings of systematic theology. Interlinear is has two definitions. Number one, that which is written on the pages of black and white. Well, I'm looking at a computer screen right now, and I see some words written on a white uh, page uh, indicating a page of paper, but it's really a page, uh, a, a replica or a duplicate of what I would see writing on a page, but uh, except there's typing on it. And these words are in black with white pages. Now, as I look at these words, I see that in between them is as much space or as little space as I want them to be based on the settings I put on the computer. So what I see is, is on the pages of black and white, there's written uh, white paper with black words, but in between the lines of text, there's nothing. So the second definition to interlinear is that which is written in between the lines of text. What is written in between the lines of text? That's where you find revelation. You say, but Dr. Bill, I've looked in between the words that are on the pages of my Bible. Unless I write something there, there's nothing there. You're just still focused on the natural realm or the English Bible or that which is written before you. But in between the lines of text, there is something. There is revelation. Now, you might say, this will take a lot of work. Uh, but think about how much work and time and effort you invested uh, to, this, to, to get you to this point in your understanding. Quite a bit, right? Amen. Okay, so it's very important that you understand that, hey, if it took this much time to get messed up, it did for me, uh, then I'm willing to invest the time to get straightened out. All right, Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 10, and this is the Passion Translation again, says those who are motivated uh, could be interpreted as inspired. Uh, by the flesh, only pursue what benefits themselves. But those who live by the impulses or the motivation and inspiration of the Holy Spirit are motivated to pursue spiritual realities, uh, or this could also say uh, pursue things of the Spirit. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset controlled by the Spirit finds or discovers life and peace. In fact, the mindset focused on the flesh fights against God's plan uh, fight, fights against, uh, fights God's plan and refuses to submit to his direction or to his mind or mindsets because it cannot for no matter how hard they try God finds no pleasure this is the Greek word here pleasure adesco uh, 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 adesco uh, now, this is an important word because you'll find this in Hebrews uh, 11, verse 6, when it says uh, that those, uh, that to, um, um, for without faith it's impossible to please him. You'll find that word please there. And it means agreement or to be agreeable. So to please God literally means to be in agreement or to be agreeable with God, uh, with those who are controlled by the flesh. But when the Spirit of Christ empowers your life, or makes his home in your thinking, 
you are not de de uh, uh, um, dominated by the flesh, but by the spirit. And if you are not joined by the spirit of the anointed one, you are not of him or of his mindset. Now, verse 10. Now, Christ lives in his life in you. And even though your body may be dead because of the effects of sin, this, this is the Greek word hamartia, meaning mistaken identity. It's a, it's a compound word, and it's a very important word. It's probably one of the most important words you can learn in Scripture. Uh, it goes on to say that his life giving spirit imparts or saturates the life or uh, or your entire being to uh, to you because you are fully accepted by God. Now, just and and I think it's very important that we really do understand this. Okay, uh, and I think that's this. Uh, that Jesus, just as Christ, is the accepted and the beloved, you also are the accepted and the beloved. You're accepted in Christ Jesus. In other words, uh, you could say, I'm accepted in the company I keep. Well, it's bigger than that because you're accepted by the Lord uh, in spite of the company you keep. But here's the thing. The things of the Holy Spirit in reference to doing what pleases our Father, Creator, uh, we see in the Aramaic that it can be translated to read, uh, those who are in the flesh only see Him in the flesh, but those who are in the Spirit see Him in the Spirit. Now, this is a common way that the carnal mind of thinking, the carnal thinking, the mind of, well, I'm going to say it this way, the, the mind of carnal thinking within mankind views God. Or in other words, carnal reasoning creates the image of what uh, it thinks God is based on a human form evaluation and understanding based on their individual human form experience. So you say, but Dr. Bill, really, it, 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 do I really create God in, in the image I think I see him in based on the experiences I've had in my lifetime. Yeah, you know, I know a lot of people uh, who really do view God as not such a good person. Uh, and it's all because of the bad experiences they've had in life. Now then, on the other hand, there are people who have had wonderful experiences and have a wonderful uh, view of God. Uh, but uh, still, we can all improve based on our understanding. Okay, now, in the English Bible, the picture is painted of refusing to submit to the law of God. However, the fact is that the law refers to, uh, was well, often uh, the law of Moses, or uh, and yet God gets the blame for it. Well, to submit to God is to agree with God, right? Uh, yet not based on an Old Testament law, but on the mind of God, which holds the eternal truth and was implanted within you before uh, there was even a law of Moses. Think about that. So here's another thing. Did God need to find his home in you? Or has his dwelling always been within his creation? Well, the fact is this also, that, uh, that if God needs to find, now, now listen to this. If God needs to find his home in you and me, then we started out as separated from God. This is the point right here. If God needs to find his home in you, as the English Bible tells us, then we started out as separated from God and not one with God. Well, that's often what we see in the English uh, scriptures. And I'm not trying to down the English Bible. Don't throw your English Bible away. You need that to get to where you need to go. But what we can say is, is safely say that it's not the way the original text conveys God. Now, Genesis 1, 26, just real quickly, says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, here's the thing. When you look at Genesis chapter 1 as the first six days of creation, I think we really miss the point. Now, for me, I teach Genesis chapter 1 is God's explanation of what happened in eternity past. All right. 
That kind of puts it all together, but you can see a better perspective. So the first thing I want you to see is that you were in Genesis 1, verse 1. And the explanation of your creation moment was explained here in Genesis 1, 26. Uh, again, you were in Genesis 1, 21. That's when you were created. Uh, but also you see the explanation of that in verse 26. Uh, in that you were created to reflect your Father Creator, and this eternal truth cannot be established, uh, uh, cannot be uh, established or explained from the starting place of separation. I, I want to say that again. Uh, you were created to reflect your Father Creator, your Father God, and this eternal truth cannot be established or explained from the starting place of separation. So if you're going to start with Adam, you, you're not going to get that you were never separated from God. Now, Genesis 1, verse 27 says, So God created man, uh, this is Adam, the species known as mankind, in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So every conceivable expression of God, both male and female, were created in his image and likeness, uh, and, 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 and like him, from the start, again, I want to repeat this. Both male and female were created in his image and like him from the start. And therefore, separation was never the issue, but only thinking and believing that mankind was separated from their creator because of Adam. Well, you've heard me quote this scripture, and I'm, I'm reading it, of course, Colossians 1, verse 21, and this is the Passion Translation. Even though you were once distant from him, okay, living in the how was I distant? I was living in the shadows of your own evil thoughts and actions. He reconnected you back to himself. So let's think about this. You know the word here as reconciled. Well, reconciled really it really can be defined as reconnect. You see, separation is not an actual reality. It's only a belief system embraced through mental ascent alone. So if I create something, so let's say I'm an inventor. If I created something by way of an invention, would that which I had created not always be a part of me from the inside out? Of course. And it would not change the eternal union uh, that you have with that which you created. I mean, I would eternal. Now, for example, many years ago, I invented something. Uh, I think there's a couple of inventions I've done, but I didn't go through with them, and somebody else came out with them later on. And now, uh, for example, when I was in construction, we back in the day, when I first started out, we would call, frame with what's called a framing axe. So it was a big round head hammer with a corrugated base uh, and a, an axe blade. The axe blade was for if something didn't uh, fit right uh, and you're on a roof, you can't grab a saw there easily all the time, so you kind of cut that away. So I got the idea, you know, this is such a balanced tool. I'm going to have the axe head, the axe cut off and have hammer claws welded on. And I did that. I used that for years. And it wasn't, uh, but uh, it was many years later, many years later, that I was in a hardware store. And there's this hammer on the shelf by Vaughn Hammers called the California Framer. It was the exact hammer that I invented. Now, uh, I never have forgotten that. That hammer is always with me in terms of uh, I did something that, you know, I mean, uh, so, so a creation never is apart from you. Now, if we can understand this elementary explanation, then it should not be so hard for people to embrace their eternal union with their creator. No separation, but just eternal union. The eternal Father, eternal Christ, and eternal Spirit have no beginning and no ending, and yet in a beginning, which was not a beginning, in eternity past, they created the entire universe out of nothing, including the species known as mankind. Uh, that's my transliteration of, of Genesis 1 verse 1. Now, 
Uh, I, I want to look real quickly at Romans, and let me see what the time is. Okay, we, we need to hurry up here. So in Romans 8, verse 9 and 10, the Passion Translation says, But when the Spirit of Christ empowers your life, or makes his home in your thinking, you are not dominated by the flesh, but by the Spirit. And if you are joined to the Spirit of the Anointed One, you are not, uh, are you not of his, uh, if you are not joined to the Spirit of the Anointed One, you are not of him. Uh, or of his mindset. Now, <coughs> we've already read this, but I just wanted to touch base on this again because it's very important that we understand since you are not and never were separated from your father, when Paul says, if you are not joined to the spirit of the anointed one, you are not of him. This can only be in reference to not being of the same mind or mindset, not thinking the same way God thinks. So from a footnote, it says this is an unusual Greek clause that can be translated, if anyone is not joined to the Spirit of Christ, uh, he cannot be himself. He cannot be himself. He cannot be himself. You're not in your right mind. <laughs> uh, I, I, that could be dangerous. But we're not in our right mind. So we need to, uh, you cannot be yourself. A similar construction is used in Luke 15, 17, the prodigal son came to himself. Okay, are you hearing this? The pieces are fitting together, right? Well, in the case of the prodigal son, you cannot find anywhere that he stopped being a son just because he journeyed off the path and just because uh, anyone, and just in case anyone told him that he was not uh, of his father, that would not have changed anything. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17 says, but he was joined to the Lord as one spirit with him. The Passion Translation says, but he, the, the one who joins, this is the uh, Greek word kaleo, uh, means to glue or to stick or to keep company, joins himself. Uh, to the mind, to the Lord, is mingled with him, uh, well, uh, mingled into one spirit with him. Now, the Greek word kaleo uh, means to unite or to knit or to weld together or to mingle or to join together, but it also means to make two into one. So we're not created the same as Father God, as being the God of all things, but you were created in his image, his likeness and expression. I'm not, uh, I am one with my wife, okay? We are one. I mean, we're so tight that we, we think alike. Uh, but even though we're joined in union as one, uh, but I am not my wife and my wife is not me, okay? Now, there's other scriptures you can look at as I close tonight. Uh, Colossians 2, verse 8 through 11 um, and it really talks about not being distracted. Uh, you can go to one of my favorites, to Psalm chapter 8, verses, I don't know, 4, 5, and 6, somewhere in there. Uh, but it's very important that we understand. There is no, forget, get separation out of your mind. There is no separation. That's a, that's a, a, a misconstrued idea. Uh, realize that you are not the creator of the universe, but you are the creator within your own self. You create and recreate by the words you speak, by your belief system. But if you keep believing that you're separated from God, that you're not of God, that you've got to do things to get to God, you're going to miss out on such a wonderful life. Uh, this really is a wonderful life. And and the fact is, is that you, you may not be God, but he created you as gods just a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, yes, yeah, same with the vine and the branch. The vine and the branch are not the same. And I've heard people uh, refute that and say they are the same, but they're not the same. Um, if you've ever done any gardening, you know that the, the vine and the branch are two separate things, just as the trunk of the tree and the branches that go out are very different, uh, have different functions. And, and so, you know, let the mind of Christ be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He's the head. He's the source of all things. You are in union with your Father even before there was a Adam. Amen. And who you were created as is who you still are today. I want to thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, I appreciate it so very much.
Um, I'm going to post a, a some some things here. Uh, if you uh, would please click like and share. Let other people know about this. I mean, this is such an important uh, lesson for me to have the privilege to teach uh, tonight. And also, uh, if you feel like you want to support this ministry, uh, we're constantly just trying to keep the overhead paid of this ministry, and uh, things are coming together. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of this, and I'm going to post some links for that. I love you. Hey, join me in the morning, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. My guest from last week uh, is going to come back and rejoin me again for another series uh, just because I had a cancellation, and I, I just felt like uh, doing that. So I'll see you in the morning, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. We love you. Thank you so much for being a part of what we do. Uh, we appreciate you so much. All right, everybody, have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.